good evening, everyone. It uh, was certainly happy that you found time in your busy schedule to be here. Uh, we're delighted, certainly, to have Senator Young here with us tonight. Um, you know, we originally scheduled this event on February 9th, and if you recall, that was, I think, the only day that it really snowed this entire season. <laughs> and it was uh, there was a, a great deal of... Uh, discussion back and forth between her office on are we going to go ahead, are we not, and finally someone in her office had, had driven in and had a real tough time and they said, you're not traveling, so whew, I didn't need to make the call because I was afraid I was the one going to have to uh, say yes or no, and, and then I knew that it probably would have a great deal of effect on, uh, uh, you know, on the crowd. Uh, you know, the suggestion to do this, and somewhere here is a guy by the name of Raleigh Kidder, and Raleigh uh, had, was talking to Greg one day, and, and the two of them were talking about the senator's recent appointment. And Raleigh said, you know, this is a really big deal. And uh, slowly things worked over to me, and, and we just delighted we were able to find a time in her busy schedule that we could uh, share, you know, some special time with her and just send along our, our note of uh, congratulations. And certainly I want to thank your staff, Senator, for helping us pull this second date together, because I know that sometimes is not, not that easy either. You know, we've been lucky as we live here in the 57th uh, Senate District, in the 150th Assembly District, to always have some outstanding people that have carried the heavy water, you know, from this far corner of New York State, you know, to Albany. Uh, we've certainly had some excellent, excellent uh, leaders you know, fight for what we need and uh, make sure that we in here in Chautauqua County are not forgotten. We obviously are a long ways away, but we certainly need that strong voice as we have needs here and we don't want to be overlooked. And we certainly have been uh, well represented here uh, with Senator Young and certainly with Assemblyman Andy Goodell. I had asked the uh, Senator's office in Albany for a bio, you know, uh, before this reception, and we received it here earlier this week, and, and I'm not going to read down through the bio because we would be here an extra 35 or 40 minutes because the, uh, the list of accomplishments are just unbelievable. Uh, so impressive, uh, and I'm sure that if, the, if another bio was sent to us in the next five or 10 years, we would need a lot more time to read through all that because I'm sure there's, there's going to be a great deal more uh, that she's going to have a definite effect on. But there was one piece in it as I read down through it that was my aha moment. It was something that I, I was aware of, but it, it reminded me again on why she is so effective and why she's so effective for us. You know, I, you know she came from a very rural setting. Uh, grew up on a dairy farm and a farm that grew crops, and she was educated here at uh, SUNY Fredonia and at St. Bonaventure. You know, when you think about that background, that's us. That's the, the world we live in here. So it's, I'm sure it's easy for her to, you know, connect with us, realizing that we're all, we're all from the same roots. And uh, certainly there are similar stories with each of you here, I'm sure, but there's... Uh, not a great deal of difference when it comes right down to it, you know, all of us here in New York State, because we all have the same mission. We want this place to be the best place to live, work, and play. We all work hard in our own little way to contribute something to that, and uh, we're just delighted here to have this time with the senator. So this is my last chance at the podium. I want to send along my personal congratulations, and I know that I'm sure everyone here that's had an opportunity to, to uh, spend just a couple minutes with you has uh, shared the same, the same sense of uh, pride that we have in everything that you're doing. The, the opportunity that I had here earlier tonight is uh, that we had a, an hour set aside for the media to talk to her about issues you know, that are very much in front of her around the state and in Albany. And, and I wish all of you had had the opportunity to listen to her and the level of uh, uh, knowledge, um, the expertise that she carries, the finesse. Um, you know, it's just outstanding to have someone like Senator Young be part of our world. So thank you again. So. <laughs> The 
So I'm going to I'm going to turn you over to Greg Peterson, and uh, hopefully he will treat you well. Uh, and Greg, I just leave it with Greg at this point on. So. I too received that same biography. I chose not to read it. Uh, it'd be much easier if we just have this idle conversation as we get through this. However, I was thinking about how I could add to the introduction and the reality is I can't add one more thing than what our esteemed governor introduced her at recently in Dunkirk. So with that, we'll run the, run the tape. Uh, Senator Kathy Young uh, is as good as they come. She is always working, always fighting. She never takes no for an answer. It's always about what she can do for a district and what she can do for the state. Uh, she's a major player in the Senate and uh, is really instrumental in uh, getting the Senate moving. Uh, I'd love to be able to say that we agree on everything all the time, but then we would have an unreal relationship. I don't think that happens. I don't even think I have a personal relationship where I ever agree with everybody. No, I don't have a personal relationship. That's for sure. Uh, but I can tell you this with Kathy. We uh, have a respect, a, a relationship based in respect uh, for each other's point of view, and that never changes. And the difference between Albany and Washington is we can have our political differences, but we're not going to let them stop progress. And we still have to move the ball forward and we still have to de deliver for the people of the state of New York. And that's what we've done. We talk about getting budgets done, five budgets on time in a row, which never used to happen in Albany. And that's just a metaphor for making government work. Uh, and I applaud my colleagues in the legislature, but no one more than Senator Kathy Young uh, who is, every time I've seen her, she's talked about uh, what's been happening here and how we have to help and how we have to make a major difference. Uh, and today, we are. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. 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 Thank Words cannot describe how important today is for our future. The governor said this is an historic day. I need to underscore that because today is a new dawn in Dunkirk, New York, and for all of Chautauqua County. So thank you. I'm a little nervous. You're good. <laughs> that was quite remarkable. Governor Andrew Cuomo, a Democrat, governor, extolling the virtues of a Republican senator here in Chautauqua County. And this is not the first time that's happened. That happened here when he gave his first state of the state at the Jackson Center. Uh, he said the same type of things. How did you establish such a relationship with him? Well, I've always felt that we need to work together to get things done. and. He obviously is very aware of Chautauqua County, but I've always felt that I have to be the squeaky wheel because we know the squeaky wheel can get fixed. And so I've been the squeaky wheel with the governor, the governor's office, and I try to advocate on behalf of rural areas across upstate New York because for far too long, areas of the state have been neglected. And when you think about Chautauqua County, for example, I have colleagues in New York City and they have no clue where Chautauqua County is. They don't. And I remember when I was first elected to the assembly, and, and Raleigh will appreciate this, but I was talking to two assemblymen from the Bronx. And they said to me, you're from where? And I said very proudly, drew myself up proudly, and said, I'm from the southern tier of western New York. And one of them said, oh, you're from Binghamton. <laughs> and I said, no. 
And the other had heard of Corning, and he said, oh, you're from Corning. And I said, no. And I, he, the other, then one of them said, there's more to New York State after Corning? <laughs> and I said, yes. And the other said, you're from Ohio. And I said, just about. But it just shows. <laughs> It just shows that we, I have to continually educate people in Albany, and I've taken that very seriously because we are away from the power centers. We're far, as far away in the state as you can get from Albany and New York City. And so I've talked to the governor several times about the needs that we have here. We deal with rural poverty. It's a terrible issue. We have economic needs, obviously. And so when I talk to the governor, I try to articulate that, that, that we really need some extra help, that we have wonderful people, wonderful communities, they're working hard, they're some of the most down-to-earth, wonderful, salt-of-the-earth people you'd ever want to meet, and we know that, we know that in our communities. We see it with the volunteer fire departments, we see it with all the community organizations, and anytime there's a disaster, a need, people reach out to one another. So I've tried to articulate to, that to the governor, and um, He's listened to his great, great credit. He has listened to us. And that's why I believe we were able to get the $25 million for WCA Hospital recently, the $57 million for Lakeshore Hospital and Brooks Hospital in the North County, able to get Athenix, and a lot of the other things that we've been working on. And so it makes so much more sense to work together than against one another. What's he like? So you get at some point you must get the doors shut in the second floor. Oh yeah, and, and you know when he when he said we don't always agree on everything, we don't always agree on everything. That's for sure. You know, and there's been the, been some things that he has advocated for or pushed, and and I fight back or disagree strongly. And uh, you know because sometimes you just have a philosophical orientation. We're from different parties, obviously or different priorities. And so my priority always is to make New York State a more affordable place to live, work, and do business, um, a place where we can actually keep our children after they graduate so they don't feel like they have to move away. We need those job opportunities here. We need to fund our schools to the proper level. There, our healthcare, everything um, is so important to me and so important to the people in my district and actually across the state. So, so he sometimes, you know, doesn't agree with me, and I don't agree with him. But do you get then, chances to kind of mano a mano, or do you have staffers? Do you ever get a time with just the two of you together? Not, not usually. Um, but I do meet with a lot of his staff on the second floor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he'll call me, Andy Goodell, and he talk on the phone sometimes. Uh, um, and in fact, the the governor was trying to call him one night because Andy was debating on the floor, and we're trying to get the budget done on time. <laughs> and uh, so, is Andy here? Is he still here? Yeah. There he is. Andy does a great job for us. He is uh, really somebody who stands up in the assembly, and really calls a lot of the things that they're passing. For example, if it's not good policy, he calls it into question, and he debates on behalf of us here in Chautauqua County. So I couldn't have a better partner in the assembly than any Andy Goodell. And we did uh, stop long enough so the budget could be well, passed Well, we did on time. get the budget on time, yeah, okay. so everybody was very <laughs> I got by that, that message. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Andy. Way to go. Enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All those in very good. You're very competitive. I mean, and you're competitive in the, your political process. Was that something you grew up in being a person who was from a, a, a dairy farm in Livingston County? Was that part of your nature? I think you had to be a little tough to be on a farm. And, and plus, I grew up in a family of six children. I'm second oldest. I still eat very quickly because <laughs> if you ever wanted to get seconds in my house, you had to be right on top of things and right on the ball. Um, but I was very fortunate in how I grew up. And my heroes in my life are my parents and my grandparents. And so my dad worked so hard. You know, I was thinking about this this morning. I can't think of a time when he didn't work at least a 14-hour day. A lot of times it was longer, up to an 18-hour day. And uh, some of my best memories, I, I was his shadow. I was his girl Friday. I was his chief assistant. I was, from the time I could walk, I was with him on the farm. And my grandfather had had the farm before. So with my dad, I did work things. And with my grandpa, he kind of pitched in because he was supposed to be retired. But we did fun things. 
And my grandpa always used to say, don't tell your mother, because we, we kind of did think, you know, like he'd hook the toboggan up to the back of the truck and take me through the field and <laughs> things like that, that my mother probably wouldn't have appreciated too much. But they really were my heroes. And, and you know, I remember as kids, we'd be out playing in the, in the lawn in the summer, at the end of the day, he'd be bone tired trudging over from, we had a wooden barn from across the street. And he would stop, all, you know, you could tell he was just so weary, but he would stop. And all of a sudden, like he'd kick the kickball or hit the tether ball or start, you know, just start to play with us a little bit. But I decided early on that if I wanted to really spend time with my dad when I was a kid, I had to work with him. And what a great life lesson that was. That was just, it taught me so much to be, to be able to work alongside him, see what he did. And no matter how busy he was, he was still president of the school board. He was on the town board. He was a justice of the peace in Avon for, for the village and the town for 32 years. And, and so he was a great mo role model for hard work, but also public service. My mother did so much volunteerism, and she was absolutely wonderful. And I think about how hard my grandparents worked, because my grandpa and grandma lived down the road. Um, you know, During the Depression, when my dad grew up, they had to sacrifice so much. Um, she used to take in washing, so she'd wash other people's clothes to make ends meet. My grandpa would do the same thing that my dad did and you know, work 18-hour days every day. So, so I feel so fortunate that they, to have that kind of background, and it's really kind of led me to where and who I am today. That public service aspect of it, that your dad was involved in the school board, was he involved in politics at all? Well, because he ran for the town board, he had to you know, do the political thing, and, and they did caucuses in the town, so it was a little bit different. But then when he, he had to run every four years for Justice of the Peace. And so I helped him a little bit with his campaigns. And uh, that was a great learning experience for me. Did any of your other siblings get involved in politics at all, were they? No, you know, it's, it's interesting because we have a, a wide array of uh, careers in my family. I have teaching my brother as an attorney uh, like you. Like a surprise, like, uh, yes. wow, an attorney. <laughs> Andy, pick <fake> note. <laughs> and he was made for that job because when we were kids, he always had to get the last word in. Yeah. And so it would drive my father crazy. And he's a year younger than me. I'm sorry to all the attorneys in the crowd. But uh, it would drive my dad crazy. And, and so, so what my dad would do is make him walk around the fence row. Um, like in this huge field out behind the house so that if he got had to keep getting the last word in, it would allow him to cool down a little bit. So we'd make my brother walk around the fence row. But, but um, you know, it, it's, it just uh, is interesting how my family has kind of gone in various directions and none of my children. Um, they're interested in current affairs. They're interested in, you know, their community, but they're not interested in running for political office. I didn't want to bring this up so early, but... If they're interested in current affairs, you can't help but watch the current affairs that are on TV every night, and they ultimately hover around presidential candidate Donald Trump. What, when your children ask you, what do you think, what do you tell your children? I think he's obviously striking a chord with people, and uh, that's why I think you see this um, support for him, and he seems to win in almost every state in the primary. Um, and so it's interesting to see because this defies all conventional wisdom of what we know have known in the past as far as you know what his background is, um, you know some of the ways that he talks about things, and you know same on the Democratic side I think with Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders where. Um, you would think somebody like Bernie Sanders wouldn't even have a shot, but you see that's a competitive thing going on. So it's a different year, and I think people are fed up with Washington, obviously, and I think that's what is motivating people to be supporting a certain candidate or not. Do your kids get this? You've, you've explained that, and it's very wonderful, but do they say, what a circus is going on? Or do, do, do they editorialize at all? Do they, they try to get... Oh, I think they do. And my children, just so you understand, they're, they're 31, 30, and 27. Okay. So... Yeah, all right, enough said. 
yeah. So they may, that, be, they're, they may be curious, but yes, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, so it's not you know it's not like they're they're younger and uh, okay. so they they get it all and uh, and they follow it and have their own opinions, which is wonderful. And that's how I tried to raise them is to be independent people, independent thinkers, and um, you know be able to. Uh, again, work hard and have careers, and I'm so proud of them because then they've been able to achieve those goals. High school, what was that like for you? It was interesting because when I was about 13 or 14 years old, um, we had something happen that really affected my high school life, and that was that it was hot August night, and our barn was filled to the rafters with hay, and all of a sudden, somebody was banging on our door around midnight, screaming, your barn is on fire, your barn is on fire. So all six kids ran downstairs, and my father had been out the door like a shot. And there was a big bay in the barn, and it was it, there was a hay wagon that was attached to a tractor, and it was fully engulfed in flames. So my dad jumped on the tractor, and we're all standing in horror outside, and I'm thinking my dad's going to die because he's taking that out of the barn to try to save the barn. He unhitched the, the tractor and got away, but by then the whole barn was just engulfed in flames. And uh, that fire was so big it burned for three days. Mm. And my dad couldn't afford insurance, so all of a sudden the source of his livelihood where he conducted all of his business was gone. And it was a, it was a very difficult time for our family, but you know what? It, the, the silver lining was that there was such an outpouring of support you know, people bringing food to the house, offering to help. The farmer up the road said, bring your cows to my barn. We'll take shifts and we'll, we'll, we'll milk in shifts. Um, and so we figured it out. But, but, you know, I'd always worked on the farm, which is great. But then I decided to help my family out. I would get a job in a local restaurant. And so I was about 14, got the job. By the time I was 16, I was a supervisor at the restaurant. And, um, and so I worked a lot during high school, which was great, but also I, you know, I was able to play sports. I was on the volleyball team and varsity volley volleyball and, uh, and, you know, really had a lot of friends. And I feel blessed by that fact because even in high school, like I wasn't in one clique. I just kind of like had friends all over the place, all different groups. And uh, I still treasure a lot of those relationships today. Why Fredonia? Well, it, I wanted to go to Fredonia because um, I had had friends who had gone there and they really loved it. And so I wanted to get away from where I grew up because, you know, two hours away, but not too far away. And also it was more affordable because, God bless my parents, they put six children through college. And um, so, so I decided to go to Fredonia and I was so glad I did. Um, but it just was a wonderful experience. But I started out, I didn't know what I wanted to do as a career, and this is kind of a funny story, but when I was in high school, I just couldn't figure it out, couldn't figure it out. You know, my grades were good, I had a region scholarship, but didn't know what I wanted to do as a career. And so I took one of these kind of crazy tests that they give you in high school to see what it recommended I should do. And it came back and said I should be a housewife or a mortician. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was really like, what do I do now? And by the way, I can't stand the sight of blood, so that, that was really discouraging. So I went to Fredonia, and I had started out in speech pathology, decided, and, and by the time I had gotten there, I, I already had a lot of credits um, because I had taken CLEP tests and so on. Um, changed to education, really loved that, and uh, was getting ready to do my methods in student teaching, and I was taking a writing course, and... I remember it was Dr. Schweik, and he writes, he writes um, detective novels. And the whole course was you wrote a midterm and you wrote a final paper. So I wrote the midterm, and he wouldn't just give it to you. You had to go into the office and meet face to face. So it was very imposing, just like you are, Greg. And, <laughs> and so I go in, and I sit down, and I'm nervous. and. It had like A++ plus, plus, plus on it, and he said to me, you have to be a writer. And at the time, Fredonia did not have any kind of communications program, so that's when I decided to transfer to St. Bonaventure University. How was the basketball team at St. Bonaventure then? Um, they, were, 
they were pretty good, but you know, they weren't like the Bob Lanier glory days. And, uh, but we used to go to the basketball games quite a bit and it was a lot of fun. Do you remember those? I mean, you had been about 10 years old when the Lanier days were. I do because there was, um, there was uh, a, a guy, a kid from Avon who I knew and he was the team manager. Mm. And so we used to watch it on our black and white Magnavox TV. And uh, I would, we'd always look for Steve Harrison, who was from Avon, because he would be on the bench. And so that I was probably looking for him more than I was looking for Bob Lanier and people like that. But I do remember those glory days. And I'll tell you, Nolian, they still talk about that. When after the final four, when Bob Lanier blew his knee out and they should have won that championship, it was such a heartbreaker. Uh, Everybody, and I mean everybody, apparently lined the streets in Olean and welcomed the team back home. And, and that's something that is still special and still spoken about today. For the Jackson Center fans, uh, on April 18th, one of the members of that team, Paul Hoffman, will be here. And we're going to do what, what we're doing right now. Oh, my gosh, that'll be great. Yeah, yeah you're welcome back. Um, you have nothing else to do in April, do Nothing. Budget will be nothing, done. Nothing Budget will be done. Come on <laughs> right, back. Nothing going on. So you're St. Bonaventure, and what is it that you, did you, did you go to mass communications? Is that what you got? I did, so I, I majored in mass communications, and, um, and that was great. And it was like a fish to water, because I love to write. And uh, so I got my degree. And two weeks after I graduated, I did get a job. And, it, and remember, this was 1982, and the economy wasn't good then, and there was a recession, and there were not a lot of jobs around, but I did get a job as a reporter for a weekly near Rochester, the Brighton Pittsburgh Post. And I remember I was making $4 an hour, and uh, but we only got paid for 40 hours, and we we're supposed to be able to take comp, comp time, we never, never did. So I worked during the day, and then covered meetings at night. So it was the school board, the town board, the village board, the zoning board, the sewer board, every board. And I really wasn't making enough money, so I got a second job that was flexible, and I was cleaning office buildings in downtown Rochester at night. So oftentimes I would work until maybe 10, 10 at night going to a meeting, and then head off and go um, you know, clean offices. And I remember one night you know, I was kind of crying into the toilet bowl, thinking to myself, I went to four years of college for this. But I'll tell you, you build character that way, you work hard, you set your goals, and then you just keep you know, going up, and, and that's what I did. And um, so I value every single experience that I've had in those regards. So you were crying in the toilet bowl when some of these guys out here were not crying in the toilet bowl when they were in college, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> so good for you. I, that's nothing to do with anything. Uh, going to, attending all of those town boards, sewer boards, board boards, uh, did that spark a political interest in you? You know, it did. It was very interesting for me to actually cover government and see, you know, how it worked, write about it. When I was a kid, you know, it's I've always been involved in very curious about current events. I remember when I was seven, watch or reading news. My parents got Newsweek and Time magazines, and even though I was seven, I was reading those because I was interested in what the news had to say. You know, and I remember, you know, some to just stand out. I remember after the Man Manson murders, for example, and, and, you know, some of the stories and the disturbing pictures. I, I probably shouldn't even have been reading it, obviously, at that time, but um, because it was kind of a horrific topic. But, but I've always been interested in that. And then, yeah, I mean, I, I was, I, but I wanted to go into communications and public relations. So um, when, I, when I got married, the reason I ended up in Olean from Rochester is that um, I had dated my husband in college. I actually met him at Fredonia. He's from Olean, so he had graduated, so he was in Olean when I was at St. Bonaventure. And so we're each making $4 an hour, and he was back in Olean making $4 an hour, and I'm in Rochester, and so we had this deal that whomever got the higher paying job first, the other had to move. So he calls me one day and says, guess what? And I said, what? And he said, I got a job paying $5 an hour, you're moving. <laughs> so, so I moved back to Olean, and, uh, and then we got married, and uh, the rest is history. 
This is during the Reagan time period. Uh, were you a staunch Republican at that point? Were you a staunch Republican? I was Reagan? always a staunch Republican. Yeah. Believe it or not, I don't. I don't know what it is. I think you know my mother. My mother um, and my mother's family. God bless my grandma, um, Grandma Catherine Fitzgerald, um, was a staunch Democrat, and so I had that influence on both sides. And she was, you know, the Kennedys were, you know, the bomb. I mean, they they were the end all be all. And uh, I think with the Fitzgerald had something to do with it too, because sure. as you know, like JFK and. The family name, but but she was just so proud, as someone who was Irish and as someone who was Catholic, to have the first Irish Catholic president to see that in her lifetime, and so that was very special for her. On my dad's side of the family, staunch, staunch Republicans. My grandpa, who, as I said, was like my best friend when I was growing up, uh, he was a staunch Republican. So I had the influences from both, and I feel fortunate to have that kind of ba background, so that you know I understand both. I've been have both of those um, influences shaping my life and how I view things. Um, but but I, all, I always was a Republican, I have to say. And I'll tell you why. Do you want to know why? Sure. OK. <laughs> that was my follow-up question. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it was the 1968 presidential election. And I went to St. Agnes School in Avon. And um, I was seven, and we're standing outside waiting for Sister Janice to allow us to come into school. And she used to come out every morning. She had one of those big brass bells with a handle on it. She would ring it to signal us to come in. But we had to stand in formation until she did that. So one day, I hear behind me somebody chanting, Humphrey, Humphrey, he's our man. Go throw Nixon in the garbage can. <laughs> And it, maybe people remember that, but that was kind of a slogan back then. And so maybe I it had been Raleigh spit to telling that. I know. Was that you, Raleigh? Were you there? And so I turn around, and it's Margaret Burke, and who's my friend. But I can only take it so long. So I turned around and said to her, Margaret, Nixon, Nixon, he's our man. Go throw Humphrey in the garbage can. And then it just kind of escalated from there. So I would say I've been a Republican my whole life. When did the urge hit you to actually take that political bent and actually turn it into action? Run for office, or even consider running It was for kind office. of by accident. I, uh, after I was working at the newspaper, I, I got a job as a stringer in Olean, and, and actually the Bradford era newspaper from over the border was trying to break into the market at the time. So I was a, I was a reporter for them. and. One of the events I covered was at the Rehabilitation Center, which people in Chautauqua County would equate the Resource Center with that. So a very similar agency. It was their 25th anniversary. And I covered it for the newspaper and talked to the executive director. And they needed a public relations person. So the next thing I knew, 1983, May 25th, 1983, I was hired by the Rehabilitation Center. And so I did that for a long time. And, and I think that really has instilled in me such a passion for helping people with disabilities. And so I started a private foundation there, um, really expanded public relations, and was on a lot of community boards, you know, the American Red Cross, Chamber of Commerce, different things. And I got a call one day about what I consider running for the Cattaraugus County Legislature. And I really had to think about it. They had some interesting characters on the legislature at that time, and it was more like a circus sometimes in government. Um, but I decided, why not? I'll, I'll, I'll try to do that. Interested in public service. And that was my first election, and that was in 1995, and I won. And then in 1998, unfortunately, Senator Jess Present passed away very suddenly in August. and. Pat McGee was the assemblywoman, and uh, she was tapped to run for the Senate, and I actually ended up running for the assembly at that time. Did you raise your hand, or did somebody come uh, draft you? Someone, uh, the county chairman at the time, Jerry Moriarty, gave me a call and said, I want you to throw your hat in the ring. And I, honestly, I hadn't even considered it. But it ended up, there were seven of us, mm -hmm. um, and we had to go through an interview process. I remember it was at the Dudley Hotel in Salamanca. But really what, um, what was difficult at that time was that my father 
my mother called me one day about a month prior and said, you know, I went to judge's school, you didn't have to do refreshers. So she went with him. Sunday afternoon, she calls me and she says, your father had such heartburn, he made me go to class with him. And I'm like, mom, he's having a heart attack. And she said, oh, no, no, he's, he's just got heartburn, he's okay. Well, and it, as it turns out, he actually had had two massive heart attacks and hadn't even gone to the doctor. And I think it's, you know, your farmer, you're tough, you work through it, you can't get sick, you can't whatever. So they finally had determined he had the heart attacks and he was in the hospital and was going to have surgery. And I called my mother that morning and said, Mom, I, I'm just coming to the hospital. I'm not going to go to this interview. And she said, oh, no, he's fine, you go. And she said, they're not going to do surgery till tomorrow. So it was a seven or eight hour process to go through this interview. Next thing I know, I'm the candidate raising my hand, taking an oath. I run to the phone booth, because this is back in the Stone Ages, call my mom at the, hos at the hospital, and she says, oh, your father just came out of surgery, but he's doing okay. So I jumped in the car, went up to the ICU, and uh, you know, and this is my dad, who's my hero, and uh, so that was hard. And then, but this was a Wednesday, by Friday I had to be on the bus, Amo Houghton's bus, with gov our congressman at the time, with Governor Pataki and Dennis Vacco, the Attorney General, Mary Donahue, the Lieutenant Governor, and Bruce Blakeman, who was running for the Comptroller, and Pat McGee, making speeches across the Southern Tier. So we started in Chautauqua and made our way all, all the way over to Allegheny County. So it was quite a, you know, kind of a overwhelming time to, to have all that going on. Um, but my dad has always been very supportive of me, and so, you know, I would just keep going back and forth to the hospital and spend time with him, and, but the campaign was underway at that point. You just mentioned a whole um, interesting group of people on that bus. Uh, talk to me about Congressman Houghton. I love him. He is another one of my heroes, and I had the opportunity to go to lunch with him in Corning this past summer. And you know he's getting up there in years, but he is still the same gentlemanly, wonderful, warm person that he was when we knew him when he was our representative. And he um, he uh, was very interested to know and who was doing what, and how Chautauqua County was doing. And uh, but he was like a mentor to me. And uh, the thing with him, it was always about civility and you know getting things done and, and and so i so admired that in him i still do um and it's funny because governor pataki had to be on that bus and the reason is the first time he ran in 1994 uh amo said why don't i take you on a bus tour across the southern tier and so uh, candidate pataki at the time said yeah that's a great idea so they did it and he won and so then every time he ran after that he had to do the southern tier bus tour it was just like it was like a point of superstition for him i almost think but uh but it was great to be in that bus but it, it was pretty uh daunting at the same time because like overnight I'm the candidate, hadn't been briefed on anything, and the next thing I know, I'm making speeches with this group of individuals across the southern tier. Did somebody hand you a script? No. Nope. You just, just wing it. Like tonight, you're winging it. Winging it. Yeah. Yep. You're doing a great job. Um, Pat McGee, you followed her. Uh, how much did she mean to you? I'll tell you, she was such a great role model, and I think it's her work ethic, too, that really inspired me, because people remember her for that. She was all over the place, just like I try to be. Um, she showed me that you really need to be in your communities, in touch with people, listening to people, because, and I feel the same way, you can't represent people unless you know what's important to them. You have to be out there in touch with them. And she was so fantastic at that. She really was. And uh, she had just such a vibrant personality, one of a kind. They broke the mold with her. Just some of the funny things that would come out of her mouth. But at the same time, she was always so caring and uh, just wanted to get the job done. Give me her best quote. <coughs> okay, let me think. 
she, well, she, she, her husband, Mike, was a great, great guy and very supportive of her. Mm -hmm. And uh, she'd say, like, say she went somewhere and there were a lot of antiques. She'd say, well, you know, Mike is a lot older than a lot of these antiques here. So she just make fun of things all the time like that. And um, it was just, it was a hoot. Then, did you know just present? Did you? Yes. Did, okay. So when I was on the Cattaraugus County Legislature, that's when I first met Jess in 1996. And uh, we worked together on one project. He was instrumental in getting money for a water treatment plant that needed to be replaced in Olean. So I was representing Olean on the county ledge, and uh, I worked with him on that extensively. But didn't know him as well as I got to know Pat, obviously. So you hear that uh, Senator McGee passes away. Um, did you assume that was an, 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 uh, after the mourning period, but do you assume this was the natural step for you to follow her? Um, you know, I was just really focused at the time on losing Pat because that was a huge loss to the Southern Tier to lose Pat. And, um, but again, I was approached by people and, and who said, we really think you should do this, that that you could carry on Pat's legacy. And um, I thought about it because I'll tell you, the Senate is a lot more responsibility, a lot more work now. I worked my you know, tail off when I was in the assembly, but in the Senate, all of a sudden you go from representing about 130,000 people to 300,000 people. And there's 4,100 square miles in my Senate district. So it was really, an undertaking, but I decided that it was a challenge I wanted to take on because I felt like I had something to offer and that I could get positive things done for the people in my district, and, and so that's really why I decided to do it. You ran, ran successfully, and continue to, to win, win, win. Uh, and you say 4,100 square miles? Mm-hmm. Is there any square mile you haven't been in? No. <laughs> no. You really are the most indefatigable person I've ever met. You were everywhere. How many miles do you put on during a year? Usually at least 60,000 miles. And that's you know, a function of getting around my district, of course. And, and there are, honestly, there are some, I have colleagues in Long Island and New York City. So on a Monday, talk about what you do over the weekend. And they'll say, you know, I got to five events on Saturday night because they can just like walk up the street or drive down the street. And I'll say, well, I got to five events on Saturday and it took me 15 hours. And sometimes it, it is like that, I, you know, because we're so spread out. And, you know, I may have to go to Livingston County and then go back to Chautauqua and then go, you know, to Cattaraugus and then head north, you know, over to Allegheny, but then head north back to Livingston or something in the same day because of important events that I have to get to. So it, it can be challenging. I spend my life in my car, it feels like, sometimes. Who schedules you? I, have a, I actually have two schedulers, one in Albany, because at this time of year, and we have some people in the crowd who have been to Albany to see me in the last few weeks, but people want to come to talk about the state budget, legislative issues, and it's so packed there sometimes. I might have a meeting every 15 minutes of constituents or groups coming in of committee meetings and then session and then other things. So you need somebody to keep track of that. And in the district, I have somebody who does all my district scheduling and that's really challenging too. You are the first female chair of the New York State Senate Finance Committee. Probably the highest ranking person from this part of our district since as Raleigh, the historian said, Joe McGinnis back in the 30s, he was from Ripley who was the Speaker of the Assembly, I believe. Uh, for those who might not know, because uh, what does this job entail? Because you are a rock star. Well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> <laughs> um, actually it is a very significant job. Um, when you look at the Senate and the structure, there's Senate Majority Leader, and then on the organizational chart, there's Deputy, and Senate Finance Chair is right on the same line as Deputy Leader. And basically, I am responsible for overseeing the entire state budgeting process from the Senate standpoint. And what that means is, is that 
have, have to be on top of all the topic areas. Now this year's state budget, hold on to your seats, it's a $146 billion document. And so there are so many elements of the state budget, it's almost overwhelming sometimes. I went through uh, 14 budget hearings. Some of them went 13 or 14 hours long that I presided over. And basically in a budget hearing what happens is it's co-presided over by the Ways and Means Chair and the Assembly and the Senate Finance Chair. And our colleagues come in and hear testimony from state, uh, state agency commissioners, um, from other groups. And so some of the hearings went on for 13 or 14 hours. So this year I presided over 95 hours of budget hearings. So it's a lot of work to do that. And uh, it's a lot of preparation and you need to ask some very probing questions because we need to fully understand what the governor's proposals are because we'll either accept those or reject those or we'll want to add to the budget in some way if we see that there's a deficiency where some very vital need is not being covered, for example, or yesterday we rolled out a whole tax plan of tax relief. Um, and so it's constantly being in motion, working on that, reaching out and touching groups and having them give me information. So it's a, it, it is a lot of work, but it's, it's very rewarding and I can be you know, a major influence on the process. Then what, you, you conduct all these hearings, you're in the process of reviewing, reacting to the governor's budget, uh, sometimes being proactive in the sense of, of throwing new things rather than just saying yay or nay to it. But then what, you, do you have recommendations? Does it go, where, where does the filter go up, up to the second floor? So we have a very member-driven process in the Senate. A lot of people say three men in a room. That's not how it works with us because we get the, the, the governor's budget proposal. We immediately start to review it and we go through the hearings and then we go into subcommittees. So there's a subcommittee on transportation, there's one on education, there's one on mental health, there's one on the environment, there's one on agriculture. Every single component of the budget has a subcommittee, housing. Um, and they come back with recommendations. We fully review those and that's what we've done this week in the Senate in our conference. We've gone over the recommendations from the subcommittees, either said yay or nay, or why don't we change this or tweak that. And from here, we're putting together our one house budget resolution, which stakes out where we want to go as the Senate in the final budget. The Assembly is doing their one house budget resolution. They'll be passing it this coming week also. And from there, the really intensive budget negotiations begin. We have conference committees, which are bipartisan groups from both houses that negotiate areas of the budget. But when the leaders negotiate, we actually have meetings before a leader goes in. He is acting on recommendations from the senators, taking our positions as to where we think the budget should land. And then he comes back, reports back to us, and then we send him back again. And so it's all very participatory in our parts. And he's actually representing our views, but most importantly, the priorities of our constituents because that's what we're expressing to him to represent at the table. So that's really how it works. And, and uh, there's intense negotiations. This, this sometimes you're up all night. Uh, the staff work extraordinarily hard. They might go for weeks with one or two hours of sleep. It's really an incredible thing. And we're, de we're so lucky to have so such dedicated people working for us. But then we come to an agreement, hopefully, and then we pass it by April 1st. So here we are, March, in uh, early March, and uh, are you handicapping that we're gonna hit an April 1st budget? I believe that we will. You even heard the governor speak in his remarks when you played that tape earlier, and he uh, is very proud of the fact that we have been able to have on-time budgets it's something that we had pushed for, and, and they're different negotiating, mm -hmm. negotiating tactics. So in the assembly, it used to be the speaker would fold his arms and not negotiate as a tactic to get what he wanted. Um, that's basically something we've been able to get over now, and we need to have a functioning government. You know, the people of the state deserve to have a government that works and, and gets the job done. And I've always said we should lead by example because every school district 
Every town and village and county has to have their budgets done on time. The state should do the same. You just talked about the three men in the room, which is probably the perception everybody has as to how we get the budget. Uh, this year, two of those three are not there anymore. Uh, what's happened as, what's the culture like, given the fact that uh, Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver and Dean Skelos are, are no so one? in the assembly, Carl Hasty is the new assembly leader. He's the speaker. And I don't know Carl. I served with him a little bit while, because, because as you know, I was in the assembly before I served in the Senate. Um, I knew him a little bit, but he was kind of new when I was moving on to the Senate. I don't know him uh, very well, so I can't really comment on his leadership style. That's Andy can fill us in on that, right, Andy? Um, but uh, in the Senate, it's the same process where it's member driven that hasn't changed with our new majority leader, John Flanagan. Um, he has worked hard to travel the entire state. He has been in every member's district and you know, meeting with groups and touring and doing things so that he, gets, he can fully understand all of the state, not just uh, where he hails from. And he did that previously. He had been in Chautauqua County several times when he was education chair. And so he has a very in-depth knowledge of education issues, what our schools need. And so he's continuing that whole, you know, we're one state approach, which I think is very beneficial and very helpful. During your legislative career, it's been meteoric as far as just success and acknowledgement, and here you are at this level. Uh, though as you reflect back and if on March 10th, 2016, somebody were to ask you like me, uh, what, what are one or two significant pieces of legislation that you're most proud of? What would you say? Oh, <clears throat> there's a lot, but, but one has to do with telehealth. And telehealth, as you know, is brought to us by amazing technology. So now with the internet and the technology that we have, we can actually enhance people's health care, and that's through telemedicine. So for example, in one of our rural hospitals, if somebody's having a stroke, you can be immediately um, consulting with a stroke center, some of the best experts around, and you can make sure that our patients get the best care. Or we've never heard anybody say, I can't wait to get into that nursing home, right? I mean, our seniors want to be able to live independently and stay in their homes, but sometimes they have health conditions that are impediments to doing that. So through telehealth, you can monitor somebody at home so they can still stay there. <clears throat> you can do things like take their blood pressure. If somebody, you know, if you weigh them and a nurse is looking at it every day at the data and communicating with somebody and they gain 20 pounds overnight, that means a serious health problem usually, some kind of heart failure, maybe some kind of kidney problem. And so you can monitor people's health and help them stay happy and help them stay at home. That's one thing that I authored the bill, got it through. Uh, it wasn't covered by Medicaid previously or health insurance, and we were able to get that in place and do what other states are doing. That's one. Another thing that I'm very proud of is that, in, in to, for example, children in Jamestown are getting services right now. I started a pilot project to bring dental services to our communities, and we have a huge shortage of dentists here in rural America. And I just as I've traveled around my district over the years, you know, I might go to a, you know, a community and the fire department in a very Appalachian community I can think of right off the top of my head. There's only one person who has teeth. And it's because they don't have access to health care and they don't have access to dental care. So I teamed up with the University of Buffalo Dental School. And we have this, uh, it's called Smiles to Go. So it's S with Miles to Go. And it's a roving dental van. So it's actually a converted um, semi truck bed. And they can take it to schools and they bring it to Jamestown, for example, and they're bringing dental care to children who never had it before. And so they're, you know, in the rural areas, they're sealing kids' teeth because I grew up in wild water myself, no fluoride in the water. And uh, they, they told me the other day, they found, for example, a child in a very rural, poor community, six years old. All of his baby teeth were rotted down to the gums. And he had a severe infection and nobody knew. And he didn't know how to articulate how much pain he was in. And uh, so they caught it, they treated him, they had to take him to the emergency room, but he got the treatment that he needed. And they're catching these very significant issues and then teaching
teaching these children about dental health and dental care and getting them the care that they need. So it's that kind of thing that really motivates me because that's what I want to do. I want to be able to help you know, children like that or communities of people like that. And so that's something that I'm very proud of. As we draw a closure to this, uh, one, what's the question you expect that I'd be asking you at this point that I have not asked? Um, no idea. <laughs> Can you give us a little hint on NRG, what's going on? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so, as you know, we fought long and hard for that. I actually worked on it, I've worked on it for more than three years. About three years ago, we got word that NRG was looking to mothball the plant. And so we went to work and people said, you'll never ever get an agreement to repower it. And we mobilized the community, you know, we blew the roof off SUNY Fredonia Williams Center when we brought out the PSC and we had a rally. They, they did, were not prepared for that because it was tremendous. We had about 2,500 people there. And so we fought very hard and that's why when the governor says, you know, she, she fights hard, he knows because NRG was one of the squeaky wheel things that I would not give up on. So we finally, are successful, we get the repowering, and Entergy files this lawsuit and holds the whole thing up. Um, and so we're kind of stuck in this mode right now. It's such a critical issue for that community because it's, and for us, because it's the largest taxpayer in Chautauqua County. About 50% of the city's budget is dependent on the pilot payment from NRG. Uh, the school is heavily dependent on it too. There was a, you know, estimation a, a year or so ago that they would have to lay off 60 teachers in Dunkirk City School if we lost the pilot payment. So that's why I've worked so hard for it. Plus the jobs on top of it and the ability to be independent and have our own power source in Western New York. So the way it's stuck now, there is a lawsuit. We're hoping there's actually um, a Supreme Court lawsuit going on right now that could influence this lawsuit that's been filed against NRG. And that may be decided within the next month or by June. So we're hoping that goes the right way. Um, I met with a new head of NRG, he was in my office yesterday in Albany, and uh, they say they're still committed to the project. And in the meantime, I'll be looking through the state budget process. There's a, a mitigation fund for communities that are affected by the loss of power plants. I'll be working very hard to, to make the school whole, to make the city whole, and make the county whole. Nobody, I can tell you from inside, nobody's worked harder than for this project than you. Uh, you're, you're indefatigable, as I mentioned earlier. What is the, what's the one fact that we really don't know about you? You know, as we kind of went through your biography, is there a little biographical nugget that you'd say, gee, uh, this is interesting, Greg, uh, but it might have nothing to do with the politics, just. Um, well, let's see. That's, a, that's kind of a hard one. Um, I guess, you know, it's like mundane things, like I love to garden, things like that, but I don't have time to. I guess you didn't know my daughter's in roller derby. That's an exciting no. thing. I'm a, I'm a roller derby fan. How's that? That's a good one, right? <laughs> How many people remember the Bay Area bombers? <laughs> My 84-year-old mother and father loved to drive from Avon, New York, down to Olean to watch roller derby. Wow. So it's exciting. You should watch it sometime. And that you're a major in the Civil Air Patrol. Yep. So I'm a legislative major. And, and I, when I, one of the things that I was able to do in 2000 was I flew on a, a mission to uh, Greenland, which was very interesting. So I was in the back of a C-130 cargo plane and flew up with the New York Guard. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a great experience. And uh, so I was there when it was bright, 24 hours a day. And uh, we were in old barracks because it was a strategic location for us during World War II. Um, they had the, the radar detectors and to, to actually try to detect planes that may have come to attack the United States. And uh, it, was, it was great. So we went up, there were a lot of experiments going on in the glacier up there. And uh, you know Greenland is one of the biggest frauds in history, you know that, right? It's one of the biggest scams. Don't tell me. I think it was Eric the Red, Vikings. Uh, Jamestown Vikings, right? Any Vikings in the room? 
Um, yeah. But where, where are you going with the story? No, he <laughs> was he was in Iceland and he wanted people to follow him. So he, he went over to Greenland and came back and he said, you know what? I found this paradise. It's the greatest place ever. In fact, I'm calling it Greenland. And he got people to go with him. And it actually was an Arctic desert with a big glacier and very, very, very harsh living conditions. There were um, natives there who were not friendly and and so it didn't end well. But um, but uh, Greenland. It's called a Swedish Ponzi scheme. <laughs> <laughs> so we went up to the glacier, and there are scientists up there studying the glacier and that sort of thing. It was a great experience. I just took one question beforehand because I told I wouldn't take any questions. But Raleigh, we had one question, and he simply said, uh, "What do you think of the Robert H. Jackson Center?" The guy's ruthless. So here you are. <laughs> well, Raleigh knows. Where are you, Raleigh? Well, first of all, Raleigh. There you are. Um, Raleigh, I just want to say thank you to you for this. Uh, Raleigh is somebody who is a special person, as you know. And after I was elected to state office, Raleigh and I got to know one another. And he is just such a common sense person. And he has a wonderful legacy as an assemblyman that still we see today. And so I want to thank you, Raleigh, for having this idea for tonight. I'm really overwhelmed by it. Um, but, you know, so, where, I forgot what I was going to say now. <laughs> he wanted you to say something nice about the Jackson Center. Oh, one. the Jackson Center. Oh, that's where I was going with it. <laughs> Raleigh, after I got in the Senate, he, he, saw, he saw an opportunity, and he immediately almost came to see me and said, I'm, you know, we got this great project, the Jackson Center, and he was just such a great uh, advocate for the Jackson Center, and actually, Raleigh knows we're able to get some funding over the years to help uh, bring this to where it is today, although I can't take credit for that. It's all people like you, Greg, and Raleigh, and all the people who've worked so hard to make this such a fantastic international resource. And we're so proud of it, and so proud that you can focus on one of our, our local, such notable people, um, preserve that legacy here, focus on justice, uh, focus on human rights, and focus on uh, preserving history. And I think that's such an incredible mission to have. And so I am extraordinarily impressed with the Jackson Center and the fact that it has been developed to what it is today it really is phenomenal. And I'm glad, I'm glad I could play a little bit of that. Sh shameless questioning, shameless. Thank you, Raleigh. Thank you so much. I don't know how we're going to end this other than uh, if you have a final word or two. As you ref Today, we really just wanted to just pause and get to know you. You know, we know your public life. You're, you're just so, again, repeat the word, indefatigable. I mean, you're such a representative of our community, you're such a hard worker, hard charger, and, be, and behind that smile is a steely verve that it gets it into. Uh, but I, we want to thank you, but at the same time, uh, there's an opportunity perhaps to, to what's your vision and mission, and as you look forward to the next three, four, five years for Chautauqua County or in your, in your 57th district. Well, first of all, I do want to say thank you to you, Greg, and uh, he said he wouldn't be like Chris Matthews on me tonight, so I want to thank you for that. <laughs> But this was just a, a great experience to do this interview, so I really appreciate it. And I appreciate, as I said, Raleigh and Randy Sweeney and everybody who worked so hard to have this put together. And I want to thank everybody who came tonight. This is, it's very overwhelming for me to see this many people here. And uh, I want to let you know, it personally means a lot to me. So thank you for that. Um, as far as Chautauqua County goes, I really think we're on the upswing. I really do. I think w with the announcements we've had recently re regarding the hospital, regarding a Phoenix, some of the other things we're working on, and I see county officials here, Rich Dixon is up there. Um, we have some great things in the hopper, too, that you're going to be learning more about. So 
I think it's a combination of, you know, local people who are working so hard and doing such a phenomenal job and just partnering with them and then doing whatever I can to on the state level as far as policy, whether it's tax relief, regulatory relief, uh, making sure that our schools are strong. One of the things that I really want to work on, and we talked about this earlier when the press was here, but I believe there is a disconnect between our, our public school districts and the local labor needs in the job market. And we have jobs available right here in Chautauqua County. And they're having, companies are having a tough time finding people to fill those jobs, believe it or not. And so why aren't we in the schools letting students know, you don't have to leave after you graduate. You can have a great career and raise your family with our quality of life right here in Chautauqua County. We need health professionals. We need uh, welders. We need manufacturing technicians. We need engineers. It goes across the board. I recently spoke to the Commissioner of Education about this. She agrees, and I'm hopeful that we can come up with a way, because my schools agree too, if there's some way we can get everybody at the table and work together so that we can keep our young people. That's our biggest export in New York State. It's our young people. We've got to turn that around. And the culture seems to be, and it's educators and parents seem to be thinking that you don't have a future if you're young in Chautauqua County you absolutely can have a beautiful life here. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Catherine Rund.